And we're back. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback with Anna Byrne, attorney, talking about the inheritor's guide. So we talked a lot about the emotions. What about the tactical things like, what are some tips or tools around like, you should do a trust or you should do this or, you know, some of the, generally actually that's what I focus on a lot, the tactical side, but really was the mindset I thought was really helpful uh, with this whole interview so far. Um, what what tools do you like? What don't you like? Things like that. Trusts, uh, transferable and death yeah. stuff. So, yeah. So, you know, in my practice, so we're in Massachusetts, I think New Jersey is a little similar, probably more similar to Massachusetts than New York. Um, but in Massachusetts, you can completely avoid probate. And you can avoid probate by creating a revocable trust. And I, that is the number one tool that we use. I, I really have to be convinced to draft a will these days. That's just a standalone will because it's a public process and it requires probate to get anything done. With COVID and just kind of the regular court delays, we're looking at probably three months before we get an appointment. So that means three months of not being able to touch a bank account, not being able to touch an investment account, not to get any information whatsoever until that appointment is in hand. So in my practice, we predominantly draft revocable trusts and revocable trusts can completely avoid probate. But what most people don't realize is that just the trust alone doesn't avoid probate. And we have probably 85% of our clients show up in our office with a nice binder of documents that they had done 20 years ago. And they're saying, we have trusts, you know, this is to avoid probate. And we ask them, well, what do your trusts own? And they look at us like a deer in headlights and they say, what do you mean? Our trusts we don't know. We don't know what our trusts they never are. Them. And so we explain that trusts can only avoid probate if the trust owns an account or a home or an asset. So what's very important in doing an estate plan is when you create a trust that you actually have to align and retitle your assets with that estate plan. So if you have a trust and if you have investment accounts, those investment accounts have to be retitled into the name of that trust. If you have a home and you have a state that doesn't tax you on transfer, then that property needs to be transferred into trust and you can completely avoid the probate process. Oh, fantastic. So I don't and know if that's how it works in New Jersey, but that's how it works in Massachusetts. So you're a fan of revocable living trusts. What about um, any other techniques that our listeners should be aware of? So what one thing that we haven't really talked about is disability planning. And disability planning is really critical. And revocable trusts are very important because, in my experience, powers of attorney are frequently um, not liked by financial institutions. I mean, we've had the major financial institutions throw out our powers of attorney and tell us that, you know, we need our legal department to review the power of attorney before it's made effective. Yeah, we work with Fidelity and some of the others when they're requiring their own powers of attorney documents now. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So what, what trusts, revocable trusts do is they allow you to name a disability trustee and the once the account is titled in the name of the revocable trust, the disability provisions and the disability trustee that's named can take over without the need of a power of attorney. And it's actually better because the account is already in the name of the trust. It's really just a change of trustee. And then there's clear instructions as to how those assets need to be utilized during a period of disability. Power, the payable on death and transfer on death um, designations are very helpful, but I find that they are used extremely flippantly by many people and they can completely disrupt um, an estate plan. So 
why would you not just want a payable on death beneficiary designation on anything? Well, first of all, where's it going to go? How, if it's going to go to a beneficiary, how are the estate taxes going to get paid? How are the cost of administration going to get paid? Are you naming someone to be the personal representative and then not leaving any assets in the estate to oversee kind of the whole administration, whether it's filing tax returns or whatever needs to be done in order to effectively manage that estate. Um, Also, payable on death beneficiary designations don't account for, well, what happens when there's a disability? You're back to square one with using a power of attorney. And if you don't have a power of attorney for that particular financial institution, then you're looking at a conservatorship to be able to access that account and use that account for the benefit of um, the, the owner. So I, I think that there, I like very much the flexibility that payable on death and transfer on death designations offer, but they can create problems. And the inheritor's guide touches on a number of the issues associated with you know, naming a child as a signer in a bank account, naming a child as a co-owner of a bank account, or just adding a payable on death designation. And I think bank accounts seem to be the best place to use those payable on death designations, but that needs to be kind of looked at from a comprehensive perspective, kind of back to the landscape picture, like what are the assets? Why are we making a payable on death designation? for this account, um, why is it to this person and not that person? You know, how are we going to treat this as the overall plan? In my practice, we, when we create this asset table, this asset spreadsheet, we actually provide funding recommendations for each and every account and every asset. And frequently we do make recommendations that payable on death beneficiaries are named on bank accounts and perhaps even other types of accounts but those should not be used without really looking at the whole landscape to make sure that the estate plan is not running afoul. I just had a client whose husband two months before he died, unbeknownst to her, added a payable on death beneficiary that removed 70% 70 of what she was going to get from her estate. And she is gravely concerned that, you know, she's not going to have enough. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Anna Byrne. What a great interview. Get the book, The Inheritor's Guide, A Legal, Financial, and Emotional Guide for Adult Children Managing Their Parents' Legacy. Thank you so much for a great interview. Two great books we talked about. And folks, if you want the book, give us a call, 888-988-JOSH, 888-988-5674. And you can go to AnnaBurn.com, A-N-N-A-B-Y-R-N-E.com. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback. The preceding program was sponsored by the Jelinski Advisory Group. Any awards, rankings, or recognition by unaffiliated third parties or publications, including Five Star Wealth Manager, Advisory of the Year finalist by Senior Market Advisor, and Top of the Million Dollar Roundtable, are in no way indicative of the advisor's future performance or any individual client's investment success. No award, ranking, or recognition should be construed as a current or past endorsement of Josh Jelinski or Wealth Quarterback LLC. Information regarding specific awards, rankings, or recognitions is available on the Wealth Quarterback website at www.jelinski.com. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. Investment strategies such as asset allocation, diversification, or rebalancing do not assure or guarantee better performance and cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. There are no guarantees that a portfolio employing these or any other strategy will outperform a portfolio that does not engage in such strategies. This broadcast should not be construed by any client or prospective client as a solicitation to affect or attempt to affect transactions and securities or the rendering of personalized investment advice. Due to various factors, including changing market conditions, the information discussed in this broadcast may no longer be reflective of current positions or recommendations. While information presented is believed to be factual and up-to-date, Josh Jelinski and Wealth Quarterback do not guarantee its accuracy, and it should not be regarded as a complete analysis of the subjects discussed. The tax and estate planning information discussed is general in nature, is provided for informational purposes only, and should not be construed as legal or 
or tax advice. Listeners should consult an attorney or tax professional regarding their specific legal or tax situation. Advisory services offered through Wealth Quarterback, LLC.